Hello, and welcome to Fireside with the VC. My name is Andrew Romans, and today we have Steve Fort from Fresco Capital on the podcast. Steve, thanks for joining. Great to see you. Uh, thank you for having me. Great to be here. So, um, Steve, maybe give us a quick background on yourself. You're an operator who's turned venture capitalist, and I believe you're investing out of your third fund. Um, so, uh, impressive because it's so hard to do that. Um, but why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and how you found your way to uh, starting uh, Fresco Capital and how you guys uh are set up? Happy to, and uh, apologize if you hear any background noise. You know, with COVID, I, before COVID, I would apologize stronger. But you know, if uh, now we're used to cats on our desktops and all that other fun stuff, so I yeah, guess we'll, it's just that we'll roll, we'll roll with it. Embrace um, it, embrace it, enjoy <laughs> it, it. Exactly, and we can talk about that later uh, when we start talking about the future of work, because I have some interesting opinions and experiences mm -hmm. there. But uh, yes, uh, so I, I am a, a former operator. I actually am an operator five times over. So I've. I've built five different, um, you know, startups over the past, you know, 25 years or so since the mid nineties, when I was pretty young at a university, I started my first business, maybe about two to three years out of college, um, which, you know, now, and nowadays that's normal, but in like 1995 or 1996, that wasn't, you know, my parents told me, what are you doing? <laughs> Where today although, they'd probably although, say what? But, but some people got the bug like me too, with the internet coming out in 1993 exactly. with Mosaic. So it was hard to ignore the web browser if you really I'm, were an entrepreneur. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up and paused me in the story because it was actually Netscape's IPO. And it's, you know, at that point I was using like AOL, right? In college and, and Prodigy and things like that. And then when you started understanding the web browser and things like that, and then I, I never had a strong opinion on the Microsoft um, Internet Explorer versus Netscape case, but I was happy that Microsoft was coming in because then I figured this will just bring it to the masses. Um, so. Agreed. I, I think it's very similar to maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago, people got caught up with the mobile boom. Um, this was the, that initial the initial kind of connectivity bandwidth dot com boom. Uh, so um, all, all five of those companies actually took some form of investment uh, Four of them. Well, actually, they all took VC investment and they actually all provided liquidity like they all exited. So um, really? wow. I guess I guess I guess that's a success. Uh, everyone says it is. And somehow that qualifies me to be an investor. I think it qualifies me to go do another startup. Um, but apparently, uh, you know, my um, my colleagues and my my investors and my and my portfolio companies all tend to think the opposite. They think my operator experience qualifies me to be a, a great investor or a good investor, whatever. Well, well, <laughs> I, I, I can't just sit here silently and, and hear that because um, I think to some extent you shouldn't be allowed to order a drink in a bar if you've never been a bartender. It's like when you see the guy shaking a, you know, I've got money. That's not the way to get the attention of this very, very busy bartender. In some ways, you shouldn't be allowed to invest in startups if you've never been in their shoes and be able to give them advice of your view on PR firms or your view on firing people or any of these things that that they're going through. And you can you can have compassion and empathize of what 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 are the sensitivities around an ESOP or a restart or any little thing that they're going through. So I think uh, there's different ways to get to being a VC, but that's a great one. Um, I, no, I, I agree with you. Let me, let me let me unpack what I said a little more. Uh, so I, I think everyone might find that interesting of, of what I mean by that is, so everything you described are the parts of the job that I love because I, I love sitting on the boards or, or, or if I, you know, sometimes we get a board observer or a board seat, but e either way, the, the entrepreneurs that we invest in will usually reach out to me and ask for advice because they know I have that experience. And, and of course, as I just told you, you know, not only did I take the money five times, but we've also sold our businesses five times. So I have that M&A experience and I can give a lot of advice uh, just around a lot of things that a normal VC might not have experience with. So I think you're right. You know, just, just this week, I mean, I'm thinking of, of some of the, the value that I think I've added to companies is, you know, I'm, I'm on the board of a company that is struggling with, with some scale right now. And I've been in that company's exact shoes as an executive, right? Like I, in my experience, and I've just given them the stories and then I've recommended them to them, someone that can help them hire. Uh, I, I, just in the last week, someone who can help them hire, someone who can help with their customer success team, a developer, and now an outsourced CFO firm, right? Because these, these are the things you need in this order. Um, and, and the founder was like, oh, I was going to get to these things, you know, in a couple months. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, no, you need them today because in a couple months, you know, you're going to collapse under your own weight and ask me how I know this. Um, so I, I, I agree. 
Um, let, let me then qualify, so it sounds like I'm backtracking, I'm not. Um, what I mean by somehow my experience as an, as an operator qualifies me for a VC. Ultimately, a VC is a um, financial decision into a company. Um, so, I'll, so compared to other financial VCs, for starters, I am a harsher critic for making an investment decision than a financial investor because I've been there five times and I look in those founders' eyes and I make a value judgment based upon my experience as a founder. Do these, does this guy or girl have it right? Like, do they, do they, are they going to be able? Are they, are they, do they, are they going to really work hard and not complain at ten o'clock at night on a Friday to leave the bar with their friends and go buy toilet paper for their office? Um, because that's what a CEO startup does, um, or do they just want to, or they just want to speak at conferences and write blog posts and be famous, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Um, and you know, and I think I'm a, I'm a tougher critic than a, than a purely financial investors that might get caught up in the FOMO and the PR and the blitzing and all that other stuff. Mm. Second is as an investor, a lot of times I will fall in love with a company. Um, and what I, what I mean by that is, you know, during the, during the IC, during the investment committee process on our end, and for those listeners that don't know, like the investment committees, when us VCs get together and say yes or no, right, basically in the sizing. So I'll, I'll sometimes be lobbying for a company based upon my belief as if I was the CEO of that company, mm. not actually. So, and, and I lose track of it, right? I just, cause I can't do it because I, at, at heart, I'm an entrepreneur. So I'm always going to, I'm always thinking, but it's not my company, right? Like I'm the investor. I'm, I'm, maybe I'll be a board member. Maybe I'll be a guider for that company, but I'm not actually the one behind the wheel making those day-to-day -day decisions. Um, Steve, you, so I you do know think what? there's some blind spots. Wait, mm -hmm. Steve, you know what? You know what test I like to give myself at this IC stage is to say, would I want to quit my job and do sales for this company? Like mm -hmm. literally, would I want to be a salesperson that has to sell this? Because sometimes you're kind of buying the story, like, okay, so I could see that this would exit at a huge amount of money and make a big return for me. But then you're like, wait a minute, how how hard or easy is it going to be? to get Cisco to pay for this or to get someone to open their right. wallet and pay for this. And, and sometimes you're like, frankly, this looks like a really hot thing to be in right now. I would love to be the salesperson for that company. And that's when I can get more conviction myself at that level of putting myself on their shoes kind of. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I look at it, it's very similar. I'm saying, you know, would this be a company I'd want to um, join? Um, or, you know, now I've, I've changed that now that we've got, you know, you know, we went from the early days after we made our first handful of investments, you know, now that we've got, you know, 60 or 70 in the portfolio. Now I'm like, is this a company I'd want to join the board and help guide, right? You know, I'm, I'm um, and that's one of the reasons why we invest in categories, right? That we have a specialty in from our careers and things like that and our backgrounds. Um, like con continuing the thread is, um, while that is a, a good thing, right? But it is a learning curve, right? Like taking yourself out of there, taking, you know, using your entrepreneur experience as a guide for, um, you know, where this company can go. And again, your enthusiasm. But then more importantly, as being a VC, at the end of the day, you are investing, you are taking money from other people, managing it for them and investing it for them. So you are making financial decisions, right? So I, I, I'm going to push back a tiny bit on your at the bar bartender waving money around issue, because at the end of the day, I'll, I'll say is a VC is a money manager. Right. So, uh, you know, if you have no experience in managing money, why are you managing people's money? And, and, and why do you think you can go out and raise a 50 or $100 million fund if you've never managed money before? Right. No, mm -hmm. I, I, I tried to, I realized I talked up in my first fundraising meetings the fact that my first job out of university was on Wall Street and I was managing money. I worked at Fidelity Investments and I worked in, right, um, even though it was 20, 30 years ago, right? I still try to bring that up. Is, so at the end of the day, it actually is a financial transaction. You have to manage a fund. You do have to manage the cash flow. You do have to manage pro rata and you have to make, you have to model out what your funds are going to look like. And um, you can't just be like, throw, you know, like, you know, just basically an entrepreneur asks for a round and you do have to push back on valuation and things like that. So I do think that that takes time to learn. Yeah, and if you're just, it could be if it's expensive, it, it could be expensive education too. Yeah, and and I look at it if I, you know having had um, far more no's than yes from institutional investors over the years because that's just the math, right? I mean, you're gonna get you know like every five or every, for every ten maybe um, institutional investors that pass, you'll you'll get one, right? You no, know, similar to your VCs as a as an entrepreneur. If I was ever in that job, I would actually run away from you know whatever company's hot today. What who just went public um, last week? Are we uh, Snowflake, right? So like if if five amazing operators from Snowflake broke out tomorrow and were pitching their fund one, I would not invest. I don't care how good of an operator they are. I'm like, right, you right. go raise money from your, use your own money and your friends and family money, go figure out how to be VC and then come back to me for your fund too, right? Because 
I had to learn how to do portfolio construction. I had to learn how to do pro rata. Like I had to learn how to, you know, negotiate stack liquidation preferences, like stuff that I was on the other side of the table weren't as much of a concern to me, except maybe the liquidation preference one, but like, mm -hmm. I didn't care about a funds portfolio. I just kept pushing them saying, I had to learn that, you know, you know two year, two year versus four year versus three year investment period, you know, 10 year fund cycle versus 12 year fund cycle. Like you had to learn all that kind of stuff, right? Um, um, you know, capital calls, like, you know, like we just, in, in our first fund, we just like took all the money, like up front here, you, up know, front. you didn't okay. realize that was an IRR, IRR drag, right? You know, like all these things that you need to learn that if you don't have that experience. So the perfect fund would probably be like two or three financial people and two or three operators, right? So that- Yeah, so I think it's a balanced scorecard of the team skill set, um, just like it is for a startup. And it's good to have a mix. It's yeah, good to have a mix. Yeah. Because I, 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 I firmly believe the VCs, the VC firms that have lots of operators in, this, in investment making decisions are going to attract the best entrepreneurs, you know, hands down, right? Like that's, that's obviously going to be the case. But you also need to be really smart about how you make those investments. So you're going to need some of those financial folks too. You know, and, um, I was on a call earlier this morning to a friend of mine in Istanbul that wants me to give him advice on his raising of his first $10 million micro VC fund. Mm -hmm. And he was saying I should write a book on that because there's no real book about it. But a lot of I spent a lot of time talking about venture capital. But I think the entrepreneur should understand a lot of these nuances that that you're facing as a money manager VC for them to understand how you either fit or do not fit into their future financing rounds. And right. you know if you're not investing based on some policy, um, they shouldn't take it personally. They should definitely not be relying on you to invest if uh, it's for some very specific logical reason not suitable. Yeah, and I, I try to remind people, um, first of all, like founders today are equally, you know, first time founders are equally as clueless about raising money as first time VCs are about investing money, right? So um, you, there is that. But what's interesting is I try to remind founders, especially if they're raising their first institutional round. I said, you, you have a list of all these VCs. And I say, you need to filter those VCs by three criteria at minimum, right? You know, the first is size of check. Like, don't go talk to a VC that's going to write a check that's way too big for your fund, right? And again, one of the things I've learned is, you know, typical VC fund, like you go read in TechCrunch or PitchBook that XYZ fund just raised a $100 million fund you should know that their first check size is anywhere from one to 2 million, right? Cause that's how that works. Like, you know, you typically, you know, you construct a portfolio of 20 to 30 companies and your check size is going to be one to 2% and you're going to use up about 40% of your 30 to 40% of your, you know, your fund size for your three year investment period. And then you're going to use the rest as pro rata over the remaining six to 10 years. Right. And I go, so that's, so that's how I teach entrepreneurs. I go like, so, you know, if you're going to pitch a billion dollar fund, for your, um, you know, two million dollar seed round, most likely there's a mismatch there, right? Go look for a fund that's, you know, anywhere from fifty to one fifty, kind of a thing, using the math I just prescribed, right? And then the second filter is um, the domain, like, you know, don't pitch a B two B business to a fund that typically invests in networks and hardware and, you know, like that kind of stuff, right? Um, or a SaaS business to a hardware or a hardware business to a SaaS, you know, like type of a thing. And then third is location and not necessarily of the fund, but of the location of your customers, right? So if you're targeting the Indian market, you know, don't go pitch Andreessen and Horowitz on Sand Hill Road that's looking really more for either a global business or a Silicon Valley, you know, style business, right? Go pitch a fund that specializes in that market entry and things like that. Um, so that that's the first kind of thing is make sure that, you know, we're available for you. So a lot of times I get a pass, I, I, I pass after our first meeting without even having to go to my investment committee because they don't meet one of those criteria. Oh, yeah. um, and, and they, you know, Unfortunately, a lot of times they will push back on that. I'm like, I, I get it. Like I, I, I do that when an LP, a limited partner investor to my fund passes, when I think I meet their criteria and they tell me I don't meet their criteria. So I understand that that's human nature, but I'm like, listen, I go, I, I'm going to give you some unsolicited advice. Kind of like, this is the operator side of Steve, not the VC Steve giving you some, some advice, right? Like, you know, like really do that whole work of the, you know, of, of those three criteria. Like you just don't fit into the criteria, right? Um, I think the second thing is, funds that are our size, right? Um, you know, we're a sub, you know, 50 million or less of the sizes of our funds, right? So we're not going to go lead your series A. I'm upfront with our founders with that. Like, you know, and we can lead your seed round and take a board seed and if you do a seed extension or a pre-A, but once you, especially with the size of these series A's, but we're not a lead for your series A. So you're going to have to go out and get a lead 
right? Um, and we'll easily follow, right? But we're not gonna lead it, set the terms. And I think that a lot of founders hear that when they're raising the seed and then forget it two years later when it's time to be a yeah, yeah. mark you. <laughs> and so see, uh, what is your specific investment uh, strategy from like even walk us through from portfolio construction. So we understand it on the VC side and we understand it on uh, a founder knowing what is suitable between your investment strategy in there. So, yeah. so how, many, how many companies would you have in one fund? Yeah, so we would typically, our goal is to have about 25 companies in, in the fund, uh, which that we feel that that spreads the risk and also spreads the risk nicely, but also increases the chances of a good return profile, right? Especially if you're looking at the old school statistics that say one in 10 are gonna be the mega hits and then you know another two out of three out of 10 will be the okay hits and then you know the rest will be so-so. Um, whether we hit that number or not is a different story. You know, it depends on the market. It depends on a lot of things, but you know, typically we get pretty close, right? You know, we're, you know, we've had about 75 companies in the portfolio. We've been around for three funds. So you can kind of do some back of the envelope math on that. Yep. And typically, as I said, uh, you know, so if I take a step back, if you remember from physics, you learn about all these things that didn't exist, you know, the frictionless surface and this, that, you know, the, so like, this is the textbook, this is the frictionless surface, right? Like, so for, you know, for Fresco, we do try to adhere towards the, um, you know, 25 or so companies in the fund, um, you know, one and a half to 2%, you know, for the first check, right, you know, and saving that would, that would give about 7% pro rata, no more than 10% of the fund size total into the company, right, you know, so just this week, two conversations with two companies, two very different companies, one that's raising like 100 million, and one that's raising like 3 million, <laughs> right, yeah. but both companies that we are close with, the founders, and that we are um, both companies close with on the board, and um, have made investments since a seed, you know, since, since an early day seed, and, um, you know, so for one of them, we're basically, you know, with a larger one, we're like, well, you know, our pro rata, you know, you've already hit 10% of this fund. Like if we were going to okay. participate. So you communicate would, that to them that we're already yeah, all chips in. We cannot put more money in out of this fund. We're not raising another right. fund for. We, we believe in the transparency, even with our passes. We're very transparent as to why we pass, right? Um, and I guess, I, and I partly because I felt like I didn't necessarily benefit from some of that transparency in my fundraising as a founder. So I feel like, you know, first also we're small. So we figure the only way for us to stand out is to get that reputation in the marketplace of just being brutally transparent and brutally honest with our folks, right? Yeah, also, you don't, want, you don't want an entrepreneur walking the streets of San Francisco saying negative things about you Correct. because they don't understand why, if I'm doing so well, um, and even if they're not doing well, a lot of founders get very emotional that you're not continuing to support them and they have to start firing people or, this whole ship could be sinking. So yep. to be able to explain, hey, this is the laws of physics. It's just gravity. You're not going to talk me into this thing with your amazing skills of persuasion. So I think it's right. I think it's great if you can give a founder a flat out, I couldn't do this if I wanted to response. Yeah, then, but here's how I can support you. I'll introduce you to Steve exactly. over at Fresco Capital, who might be able to, you know, fund you or help you with customers. Or, or in this market, especially when you're starting to get to some of these bigger amounts, um, sometimes we have an opportunity to put together what's called a special purpose vehicle, right? Which mm -hmm. would still be, you know, which would still be an investment from us, but it's actually a, a special single purpose uh, investment, right? So we would go put together, you know, let's say a $20 million check size, right? Where it would be third party sources of capital it wouldn't actually be our fund. It'd be like a fund just for that one investment type of a thing. So um, how many, how many, what, what year did you start? When was the first investment out of fund one? How, how, how long back? It's about seven years or. Yeah. I would say if you wanted to put a good date on it, it would be 2013. Yeah. 2013. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how many SPV? So you've had three funds that are black box uh, yeah. commingled investments that have all that portfolio construction how many SPVs have you done over that period of time, would you say? Um, not many, um, I mean, only a handful. And, and the reason for it is maybe not necessarily for the desire, but probably because the funds, if you think about it, if we were writing, you know, 150K checks, you know, from a really small fund one many, many years ago, only now are those companies getting into big. So from that fund, we have three big mega winners, right? That are in that unicorn status. And because of the operator experience and because of just, you know, our transparency that you've described, you know, our, pro, our, our, um, 
ownership percentage is like a percent or less at this point, right? Like, if, you know, obviously if we invested when they were really, really small. Now, granted, from a returns perspective, they're like 20, 30, 50, you know, mega, mega X, right, uh, returns. But um, when you think about it is only now those companies are in the position where then we can start putting in, you know, like a, a significant where it's economically. The pro rata, so the pro rata might be a big check, a big dollar amount compared to your initial investment you made when they've popped up in valuation that much, right? Yeah, even even for a small, even for a small single digit percentage ownership at this point, the Parag can be big. But um, where I was also going with that is is because we have great relationships with the founders, they would allocate more for us right. if we could find it, right? Like yeah. if we I, want to go. Build I call that the team. emotional pro rata. You know, yeah, that's the I, emotional. I call it the sweat. I call it the, the VC sweat equity. <laughs> okay. Okay, that works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's yeah, like, so, you know, we, we, we punch above our weight class, right? Because we just to make sure to make sure listeners understand this, a pro rata equity right means Steve invests in his fund buys, say, 2% of the company at a low valuation today compared to a much higher valuation later. When the company is going to raise its next round, had you been in a price round or converted into a price round, you now have a pro rata equity right to maintain this 2% ownership position. So even if Sequoia wants to take the whole round, um, you know, if they're playing nice, you know, Steve gets to invest more money to maintain a 2% ownership percentage. If that's Pinterest, that might be $40 million check, which is a hell of a lot more than 10% big... <laughs> of a sub $50 million fund. So when you do, when you did do the SPVs, did you market it just exclusively to LPs in the fund or? Did you go Both. outside? Uh, we we have went outside um, for okay. the larger checks, but there's been several times where our limited partners have invested co um, right next to us, right? So in the early yeah. days, the reason why I didn't give you a straight answer, again, you know, out of transparency, I don't I don't dodge questions, um, okay. is because in the early days, um, when our companies were raising bigger rounds and we were not able to keep up, we would just give our pro rata to our LPs, just just really to build a relationship with both sides, right? So we okay. did that a lot in, in the beginning. Because, you know, first of all, SPVs weren't even really invented back then. They only became a thing about five years ago anyway, right? Um, so in those early days, we definitely had a lot of co-investment opportunities with our, um, our existing limited partners into our existing companies. Did that count as an SPV? Technically, no, because it actually wasn't us on the cap table. However, it, we did get that emotional pro rata because those were very passive financial investors. So we kind of kept, you know, if we had a board seat, we kept our board seats. If we just had, you know, like a lot of times something, uh, all the founders out there you'll realize is, you know, there's something called information rights, whereas an investor gets smaller than a certain size, you don't actually have to send them your P&L, you don't have to send them your quarterly updates. Um, they would still give us the information rights because they would consider us part of that equation, right? They would did consider you, us part of that. You, were you relying on that as a gentleman's agreement or friendly agreement, or did you sign a side letter that says we're not meeting the threshold of major investor uh, that has some of these preferred things like information rights, but I'm not going to invest unless you sign the side letter and agree I have permanent information rights. Was that we we've done all of them through um, we've done all of them through um, handshake in that respect. Through hedging, yeah, no, the handshakes. We've done all those through the handshake. Oh, not, handshakes not through the side. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think if you're a good value-added operator, you know, hustling VC, helping them, and you're asking for an update, I think it's pretty rude to say, "I'm giving this to Benchmark, but I'm not showing my first investors how we're doing," which makes it hard for you to report to your LPs, if not exactly. make double-down exactly. investment follow-on decisions or SPVs. No, I, I agree. I think at this point, um, you know, it, it, when you get a little later and this fund size might be bigger, you might want to consider, you know, going beyond that handshake. But I think it's it's part about that relationship you built with those founders. Like these are founders we've been with. You know, these are founders that are now building billion dollar companies and raising, you know, rounds of a hundred million. And we were a hundred K check into their like convertible note of like a $4 million, $5 million cap when they were like six people in a Starbucks kind of a thing. Right. right. So like we've been, we've been with them that right. long and we have that trust where I think now um, rounds are getting so big, so fast that, you know, maybe, you know, maybe um, who knows, like maybe at some point it gets down to that. Right. But I don't think, um, I don't think anytime soon to be honest. Okay. 
And and um, so you get into 25 companies over a period of years that builds in some diversification. What percentage of the dry powder of the fund is follow on versus that initial establishing a position in the companies for you guys? Like not not including any SPV. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, SPVs are always one off and opportunistic. So the, from the actual funds perspective, it's roughly um, 55 to 60 percent, or it could be as high as 65 percent, actually, depending on the um, the, the ratio. And the, again, the reason why there's some wiggle room there is we typically look. So, so here's the interesting part about the math. If you remember my frictionless surface comments with, with folks that were like, what was Steve talking about? Um, I remember I'm giving you the textbook example. Like in, in the perfect world, I would put 1.5% into a company in your seed round. And then I would put 1.5% of my fund. And then I would put 7% of my fund into your series A. And then I'm kind of done. And then at that point, I either have to have a bigger fund to participate or an SPV or something else. Yep. That's just, that's Fresco, right? You know, yeah. so great. And, that's, and those are good returns because I we've seen some real increase in valuation from that stage to the series A. And then right. coming at the series B, everybody wants to be in it with their big oversized funds. Right, that, they're, they're seven figure checks, eight figure checks. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're just happy to make, you know, 20% <laughs> carry on a 17% IRR where, you know, yep. your returns are just doing a lot better than that. All right. So the reason why there's some wiggle room in those numbers, and I gave you more of a range than an absolute number is because as we know, founders raise multiple seed rounds. So I have to sometimes split my, my 2% target, right. Um, from your first seed to your second seed, but then I might, you know, VCs have this concept of an ownership percentage, right? So I want to still own a percentage of a company. And so then like, I might borrow a little bit from the future to keep that ownership because these valuations are going up, right? The Brown might be more competitive, right? You know, so like, that's why I might put as much as 3% in, you know, before your series A, because I put, yeah. you know, a great, and, and a great example is, is I literally, the, the call I had right before this podcast was a board meeting, which is a, a, a company that I'm on the board of that we invested in and they had done a seed. We didn't know them. Then they did a kind of a pre-A-ish round, which we led. And that was about two to three years ago. And now they're doing like this, not quite series A, not quite seed, middle round, right? You know, so bigger, better. Seed they extension, late stage seed, pre-A. I don't even know, ma mango seed it's been called. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're going to participate, but I'm borrowing from that 7% because I put the full 2% in you know, we leaned in because we figured, okay, great, this company's trending. So we're going to go, you know, we skipped the first baby seed, <laughs> right? And now they have the big seed three years ago. So we put the full, so, so you know, we put the, the full 2% in there. So now we're borrowing from the 7% on this kind of like extension that goes into the A. So that means when it comes to their series A, we're going to be a lot smaller. So I, I kind of had to remind the founder of all of this because uh, I think he was looking for a slightly larger number. And I'm like, this is the best I can really do, right? It goes back to some of our prior conversations. Just so you were away. saving, you were, you were not going to spend it all on this late stage seed or seed extension. You you wanted to reserve something right. for the actual for A, end. which would be a bigger valuation, yeah. but big funding round, a lot less risk. Well, I want to try to preserve my board seat, you know, and I, ha I can't do that today if I don't participate. Um, I, as a board member, I'm an insider, so I get to see, I, I, I like what I see, right? I mean, you know, to some degree, I mean, there's a solution to this problem. I can just go raise a bigger fund, but, um, you know, mm. that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> um, but ultimately, well, and, and I, I say that facetiously uh, just for the, for, um, uh, listeners is if you, you have to choose your lane and stay in it. Like you can't be a seed investor and an A and a B because then, you know, like look what Y Combinator does. They invest in the seed and in growth. And, and that's the sweet spot, right? Um, because if you just, if you invest across the whole board, you're just going to wind up only doing pro rata in your companies, right? You know, so you really, um, you have to kind of pick what stage you do, right? For a fund. Um, a family of funds is a different story with different managers, right? So um, one more thing on that is, um, again, why these numbers are a little, sometimes a little off is if we had met that company in their original seed round, two years before we did our first investment, we would have done 1%, you know, into the seed knowing they were going to do a second seed, right? And then we would have put, so, so um, when we met them, they are, they skipped that round. So we didn't, so we gave them the full 2%, right? So that's why these numbers are a little off. Or sometimes we meet a company, I'm like, ah, oh, you know, maybe they'll, you know, like sometimes we do 1.5%, you know, like, you know, we, we kind of make a, we, we as VCs have to make a, 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 a model and an estimate of when 
when they're in, when the company we're investing in is going to need more capital. Um, you don't ask the founder that question because they're, they're going to say, I need this and in six months, I'll raise a series A. That's the standard answer. Uh, great. I know I, I was a founder once I gave that answer too, um, but it's not true. Right. So we have to kind of look at the cash, look at the market, look at the macro environment, right. You know, you know, factor in any kind of black swan environment, right. Which now that's on people's minds. Right. Um, I used to have to factor in a soft bank going to come in and fund a competitor tomorrow with a hundred million dollars. Right. That's one of the reasons why I stayed away from consumer. Cause I didn't want like, so, but you know, soft bank coming in and just flooding the market, you know, flooding a com competitor with, with, um, cause then, you know, then they have to go raise a lot of money really fast. Right. Um, so those are things that we look at. Um, that makes sense. And, um, I want to talk about sectors as well, since you guys have clear investment themes of where you're focused and where you have done really well. But before, um, advice for people that are starting a fund, and I told you my last conference call was to someone asking me for advice on that. Um, as a fundpreneur, um, raising like your first, talk about raising, <laughs> yeah, talk about raising, that. was that, you never heard that? No, I haven't actually. Yeah, I've funpreneur. I mean, you know, it's one thing. It's like some guys just go right from MBA to being an associate and eventually become general partner, change funds a few times. Mm -hmm. But I think someone who just started something from scratch is it's a different experience. So like, tell us about raising your first fund. What, what did you do right? And what would you avoid doing or not even waste time on? Um, for someone wow. with a background like yourself getting getting into venture capital obviously your first fund's not going to be the dream of a 250 million or 50 million even fund but but uh what did you do that worked and what advice could you give anybody well yeah uh, we definitely did a lot of things wrong you said what do we do wrong or do right i think we did everything wrong um <laughs> and got lucky i mean you know we were probably pitching too many um folks that we are, we knew we're not a fit thinking, oh, we'll warm them up for later, you know, for fund two or fund three. And in reality, those folks are good for fund four. <laughs> right? Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. Yeah. I, for I, I example, like, like for example, like, we, we talked to like a, a sovereign wealth fund that has that their minimum check is like $150 million, right? You know, we're raising what percentage of the fund do they, they want to be? Exactly. And they want to be 10% of a fund, right? You know, so that means I had to have a $1.5 billion fund, right? You know, so like they took the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, so that was a big waste of time for us. Not for them, because now they know us. Well, right? that's the thing. That big... I, I think, yeah, like when, when you work uh, for the Harvard Endowment and you can get a meeting with an up and comer um, that the entrepreneurs love, th it's their job to take the meeting. And yet there's right. a zero chance of closing them. You can tell yourself that I'm really raising for fund four while I'm raising for fund one. But there's only so many days in a month and exactly. months in a year. <laughs> exactly. So we did a lot of that stuff wrong. The other thing we did wrong was structurally. We used a, a BBI, British Virgin Islands entity. Again, we didn't know what we were doing, right? You know, so we did that. We made balance sheet investments as opposed to building of actually having a proper fund with a limited partner agreement, all that kind of stuff, right? Like mm -hmm. we just thought we were being a little, oh yeah, you know, we'll just rub Silicon Valley, like this whole came in coolie, you know, mafia kind of a thing, right? Um, came in coolly SVB mafia, right? Um, and which is exactly what we went to in fund two, where we did things right, right? Where we started using SVB as a bank, uh, Cayman Islands as a structure and, and coolly as a law firm, right? Um, so fund one was, luckily, since it really was kind of a friends and family thing, right? You know, I think most people, my advice for fund one is keep your fund goals modest. Um, don't waste time trying to get the big checks. Go raise what you can from your personal network and, and be done and go make amazing investments because, um, I was told by my bank, by SVB, we don't consider a fund under 25 million a, a real fund yet. Like we consider it like a proof of concept, a beta test, you know, that kind of a thing, right? Like we start taking you seriously when you're above 25 million as a fund size, right? Um, which makes perfect sense, right? You know, because then you're writing bigger checks and you're, you know, you're getting deeper ownership percentages, which is the big thing, right? So I think lean into that, right? Like don't, you know, unless you have a network, you know, like it's a lot different if you are a, um, if you were at Snowflake, I think I mentioned that a moment ago, right? You had a big IPO and now you're worth a few billion dollars. Sure, you, you and your friends can probably go raise a $25 million fund from friends, right? From your fellow Snowflake employees and your other rich friends, right? Around Silicon Valley. Um, but if you're just an operator who can survive a little while without a salary because you had a nice exit or something and you're, and you're going in, most likely you're only going to raise about $10 million, 
right? Uh, it's about the average. Um, and it's not super hard. I mean, it's not easy, don't get me wrong, but it's not super hard if you have a network because that's, you know, you guys just get a bunch of 500K checks, you know, 20 people, take about a year to do it, right? You know, like log logistically, right? Um, and what was the, the real thing? What, did you, I mean, at some point you can't take a hundred dollar check off of people. What did you put down as your minimum check that you're willing to take? And, and obviously it's all accredited investors that you're reaching out to. What was your minimum check size that you were? We would, we would always say, um, well, actually we used to, we used to advertise it as a million, but we would go low to half a million under like certain circumstances. And, and, you know, not that all your listeners are under NDA, but I have no problem with the Komodo in that, in that first fund, you know, I, I had some friends that were in for like hundred K or 75 K. Yeah. Like, you know, I, um, I remember, kind of a I, thing. I remember my co-founder Joshua Siegel saying, um, Oh, we shouldn't accept that check. And I was like, dude, he's our buddy from MBA. He's actually not doing this. Exactly. He's not doing this for himself. Like this is not his retirement plan. He's literally just trying to show some support, you know, and it's him. So should we take it from him, but like never from anybody else. And so we, we you and know, I, key, I even is... talked him into taking some smaller checks and, you know, he's a big guy and he opened some doors. He, you know, he might've said like, this is something I could do without the spouse I see, you know? Like, like, I don't exactly. have to clear this yeah. with the kernel. Mm -hmm. And no, that's actually the, the right thing. So I think you have to set the minimum for people you don't know pretty high, because if you don't, your funnel, then you're going to focus on the easier ones. And, and here's the advice is which I wish someone gave me uh, as the first time fundpreneur is it's, equ it's actually harder to close um, a first time alternative. Alternative is our asset class, right? VC is alternative, like private equity, um, you know, hedge funds, venture capital funds, right? So someone who's investing in this asset class, venture capital for the first time that you don't know, um, and they're putting, let's say 150 to 500K down, right? A high net worth person, whatever it is, and is actually harder to kind of get them across the line than it is for like an institutional investor that's like a, you're gonna write your $5 million check, right? Yeah, um, because it's their money, it's their money. But they also don't understand how it works. So then you have to go and explain all the, like you have to explain carried interest to them. You have to explain drawdown. You have to explain that, you know, what paybacks look like. You have to explain management fees, like all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, um, and doing that with a friend, I, the advice that I, so, so, so again, I'm not talking about both sides of my mouth. I did take a handful of checks that were like, you know, really small. And, you know, I remember talking to a buddy of mine in Europe and similar to yours, and it was, I think 150 K. And I said to him, I go, we'll draw that down over three years. Right. So 50 K a year. And he goes, exactly. I, can, I don't have to talk to the missus. And he goes, and I said to him, I go, and he actually offered a little more. And I said, I'm like, dude, you want to put enough down that if I lose it all, like, you'll probably like, not want to send me a Christmas card, but you'll still have me over your house for a drink. <laughs> um, and then if I, you know, if I knock it out of the park and I'm the next Sequoia, you know, you can brag to your friends about it and you, you know, you turn that money into a nice five or 10 X and you can do something cool with it better than you would have gotten in the bank. But it's gotta be money that like, if you lose it, you'll be upset that you're not going to be like raging mad, throwing stuff at the walls kind of mad. Right. Um, and so I've, I've actually, uh, like you, I've talked people down a little bit and say, no, 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 give me a little less. Um, you know, because they, they felt bad. Cause like I had some people that were close to the minimum, let's say, right. And they're like, wanted to edge it up. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm like, you know, this is different. Um, so that, that's, that's probably the other piece of advice is, is um, set a high minimum go out and find the investors that invest in funds that are comfortable with the minimum and have invested before, as you said, in credit investors. And then when you get close to your number, right? Like, so let's just, let's make, let's do a fictitious, um, you know, fund, right? We can do the Andrew Steve fund, right? Um, and we're, and we pass the hat around to our, you know, we both have MBAs to our MBA buddies and our high net worth buddies here in Silicon Valley. And, you know, a million dollar, not necessarily our buddies, but our network, right? We hit this million dollar, you know, we were hitting a $10 million target. We hit a couple of family offices, a couple of high net worth people. Let's say we get to like seven and change, right? My advice then is top off to 10 million with the friends from the MBA school and the friends from here. Like, you know, the buddies that are gonna write the 100 and 200K checks, like top it off as opposed to use it as a fun strategy. Because I've seen people use it as a strategy, then they raise like a million, they make an investment, and then it takes them two years to go raise the remaining seven or eight million, right? So I say, do it, do that in reverse. Go raise the bigger money first and then you know, doing it and, you know, doing it backwards. I remember, I remember talking to some friends in the Valley that um, work at large corporates, but they always are like, look at me and say, I, maybe I should leave and join a startup or start a startup. I'm like, you know, just stay there because you're making so much <laughs> on your, 
I would hate to see you destroy your whole your whole life. But um, if you just put in this amount, and at the worst, I could pull together, like even if it's a million dollars, I would I could cut that into ten investments that I'll get you into, and I could even cut it into twenty investments of fifty k. Fifty k. And and I, I'm not advocating that as a fund or a strategy or a portfolio construction, but I said you know, if I don't get to this much, I'll return the check because there's no point in doing this. Mm -hmm. And I could easily break it up into this many deals, which we think would neutralize the risk. It's, so it's not, you're going to lose it all. The time that I've talked people off the edge of wanting to make a big investment was when they, they really are super excited about the SPV we're doing. And I've right. done over 70 SPVs. So I can, Holy moly. I, I can talk to you <laughs> offline about the accounting and the admin and the operating agreements and everything, you know, to make it easier for you. But um, when someone says, oh, I'm 5 million in the fund and I want to do 5 million into this one SPV, that's where I'm like, I, I have my own greed excitement of taking your 5 million into this, what looks like a lock-in, but you're going to, you're not going to have me over to your house if I, if this doesn't work. Right. And this goes down, then you're gone. But like, so there's no re-upping in my next fund. You're just going to hate me. And it's going to be my exactly fault. Right. So like, I really, really want to talk you down on doing that. And I have mixed feelings about these SPVs because I've done a lot. And we let people put more into like three shots than they had in the fund. And they're doing great in the fund. And they just happen to be in the, the, the roughest ones that just made mm -hmm. a little or made a little back or lost it all. You know, and then they have a bad taste in their mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or you know, and and now that the spousal I see is like, no, 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 no. <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? No, not exactly, again, right? not again. It was fine to be wrong once, but don't put good money after bad. You know, and so 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 on on the fun one, and I want to talk about how do you cross the chasm of a fund one to a fund two, especially if you've got a largely retail investor base, and these things for for your stage, especially, it could take some time to. Have real distributed to paid in, so you, your total value to paid in might look beautiful on paper, right? But if they put 500k over to you, whether it was upfront or over three years or whatever, um, if you haven't paid them back the 500, they typically right. won't not, get their money realized. back before they re up. It, it, it's a different kind of person, like entering family office has a staff that's ready to re up because they love the paper returns. What's your experience there? Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you the experience and then I'll actually give the advice because my experience might be slightly different than the advice, but actually maybe not, is for our fund two, we were a little lucky where one of our exits returned a decent chunk of the fund when we were just about at that end of that investment period uh, to go into fund two fundraising. So a lot of our individual investors just said, don't even give me the distribution, just go put that into the next fund. So that gave us like a little bit of a head start, right? We had a little bit of capital. That's great. Because uh, we, were, we were flying a little close to the sun. Uh, you know, we weren't at the, you know, I tell you about this very disciplined 1.5% and 7% follow-on. Like we weren't like that in fund one. We were just like, yeah, because remember what I told you, operators, <laughs> we were just like, here's a million dollars. You oh, sound boy. really good, right? Yeah, you know, we got very financially disciplined in fund two and fund three. And now subsequently, we're starting to think about fund four. But um, in fund one, you know, we were, we were kind of flying a little close to the sun, you know, not just like, you know, management fees and all that kind of stuff, sure. But like more like just with follow-on capital with amazing companies that are now raising like a series A, right? Like we, we were much lower follow-on. So it was really great then to crack open a new fund with that distribution, right? You know, so we had a little bit of a head start. The advice I would have is that can't happen to everybody. You know, um, you know, and, and the bigger you are with that early exit, the more successful a name brand you're going to be. It's like, look at Union Square Ventures, right? They had the mega exit in fund one, and then they, everyone came running to them in fund two, right? Like, they didn't have that mega exit. We may never have heard of those folks Fred and other, other, other funds, right? <laughs> so um, more importantly is assuming you're not going to have some of those early returns because that's actually an outlier. And, and I don't want to misrepresent ourselves. Our, 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 our return was great. Um, but it wasn't, you know, a mega home run or a mega this, right? It was just enough to kind of give us a little bit of like goodwill and a little bit of cash back to people that were then they were willing to re up. Or, okay, so just just like to it wasn't prove like a ten x return. Yeah, I mean, it returned a decent chunk of, of the fund, but it didn't. It wasn't like a fund returner, right? Like you know, so if, you know, it wasn't like a hundred. You know, it wasn't like a, um, you know, like I was returning one hundred percent of the fund in the in the investment period. It was a good chunk. 
but good enough that I had a combination of two things. Again, some people just said, take that distribution or some, some said, take that distribution, here's a little more, right? So that, again, that was a great head start. If I had to go do it all over again and I didn't have that exit, I would do what we also did, which is for fund one, I would suggest again, going to like your network and going to the high net worth people that are like one step removed from you and, you know, going, you know, and then topping it off with kind of like the friends and family, like 50, you know, uh, you know, not 50, more like 100, 200 K checks, right? Um, for fund two, I would suggest is finding an anchor that's roughly the size of fund one, right? And that's kind of where we landed, right? You know, and, and usually that anchor at your, because remember, if your fund one was modest, you know, five, five million, and I've seen funds five million, 10 million size, right? If your first fund is modest, like ours was, you know, finding that anchor at like a $10 million range isn't all that hard, right? Because, you know, 10 million is actually not a lot of money when it comes to investing in, you know, these things. I joked with some of my founders that were raising, you know, $20 million rounds. I'm like, you know, you're raising as much as Fresco's entire AUM at this point, right? Yeah. Um, so um, typically that that is going to be one of two categories of, of institution, of, of investment. The, the first category is going to be... Um, you have beaten your way to the door of a solid kind of institutional investor that invests that, that writes checks into um, you know into see, you know into into earlier stage funds, right? And what they're really doing is they're taking a bet on your fund three, right? So a little piece of knowledge is when a VC, I'm sorry, when when an LP is investing in your fund, they are not going to get the they know you're going to come back to them in two to three years. They know they're not going to have the data, so they're making a value judgment for the your next fund as well. And, and a mm -hmm. dirty little secret, the bigger and more institutional, they are under, the investor, they're under the pressure to deploy, let's say $100 million into you over the course of five, eight years, right? So if you go to them with a fund that like, well, here's our fund too, and it's 20 million, they're gonna pass. They're not even, they'll take the meeting, but they're, they're gonna pass very quickly, right? Because they're like, well, I can only be 2 million into this fund because I can only be 10% of the fund. Um, but then at the same time, um, if, if their fund two is only 20 million, their fund three is probably only gonna be 50 million and I need to deploy hundred million over this time period, right? So tell them about your aspirations. Like, oh, I wanna do a fund in India and I wanna do a growth fund that's gonna, right, you know. Um, but, but, but walking that back, that could be your first avenue. Your second avenue is a corporate like a, or a strategic investor, right? Like someone who um, aligns with your thesis, right? Um, mm -hmm. That does, like if it's a corporate, someone who does not have a CVC, right? Those take longer to close but once they close, you're pretty much locked in, right? They, they are a good partner and, and like that. So we actually had a corporate as a, um, as a, um, as a, an anchor in our second fund. Uh, it was a corporate in Japan. Uh, they've been a great partner. And um, again, they were probably about the size of the previous fund. And then that, along with the re-ups of, you know, a handful of the onesies, twosies, you know, the smaller, um, you know, non-institutional kind of friendly investors gave us the capital to start making some investments. Um, right. And then going and going in and completing out the fundraise was not as difficult, right? Because now you've got, now once you've got that anchor into the bank and you've got that initial re-up, um, we also were lucky where one of our previous um, founders um, you know, exited and then actually made a, made a small investment into the fund. So that was, you know, while it was more symbolic than anything That's else, great. Yeah. It's, 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 as you said, it's great. It's a great, it's a great signal to those, um, you know, to, to those institutional investors. So that all of that has been, um, you know, kind of the way that you can um, build it. So again, if you don't have the um, early exit that you can leverage off of, find, find other ways to differentiate, right. For that second fund, right. Like, you know, just whether it's, um, you know, one of your founders recommends a limited partner. That happened with us once, right? One of our founders, like a family office invested into one of our companies and they asked the founder, you know, hey, what are some of your investors that you think would be a good fit for us? And they made that introduction, right? And they became- Yeah, I love, our fund. we've had that happen too. Uh, one of our founders introduced us to a bank and then the bank invested in our fund, which was great for our FinTech stuff that we mm -hmm. can have that strategic value, even run things up the flagpole for domain expertise, you know, in your case, exactly. bringing them to Japan, that, that, that's a beautiful thing. I also, I love it when founders introduce us to other CEOs to invest in, you know, that's exactly. another, that's another great thing. And listen, just with the last remaining time we have, maybe uh, let people know when they should reach out to you. I know future of work is an area that you're really passionate on, mm -hmm. even telemedicine. You guys are accidentally positioning yourself right before COVID <laughs> and are getting a good bump from that. So, so what, what, what topics do you guys most interested in right now? 
No, we do um, Future of Work, and we've been doing it before it was cool. We, we used to call it Hell Tomorrow Works, um, was the name okay. of the fund. Uh, and then it became Future of Work about five years ago. Uh, digital health and education technology. So, you know, you know, two, maybe even three of those were pretty boring a year ago. Now, obviously, with COVID and work from home, and obviously with digital health being so critical with the pandemic, and then, of course, with the education, with kids being home. These are three very exciting categories now. So those are the categories. Um, for the sizing, it really is, you know, your seed round, right? Like, so not, you know, two folks in a Starbucks trying to get product market fit, like, you know, a couple customers, you know, some validating revenue doesn't have to be like mega millions, right? Just validating revenue that shows that this product market fit. And, and what's, building... a, what's an MRR number to, to live by? Is it, pre, is it case by case or is it, it is specifically totally 50K a case. month, 100K a uh, month? Is, there's, I mean, we've done, we've done these with, an ARR at like, you know, really, really like you'd be shocked, right? How low they were. And we've passed on ones that had AR 10 times higher, right? Um, or MR, it doesn't matter, right? AR, MR, right? Um, it, it really is a combination of what is the growth been looking like? Uh, what is the market? So it's a combination of the market itself, how capital efficient the company is going to be. You know, it's so like fintech companies tend to be less capital efficient, right? You know, consumer companies tend to be a little less capital efficient than let's say a B2B business or this or that, right? You know, a, SaaS, a pure SaaS business, right? Um, so we could, you know, if you're something that's to be more capital efficient, we might go in earlier where something would be less capital efficient. And, and the reason why capital efficiency is so important to us is it determines how much money you need to raise later and how dilute yeah. people get and right, things like that. So unfortunately, I, I'm not dodging again. It's, it, it really it, it really does depend. We, we have made one or two investments pre-revenue in the, in the course. I don't think that that's the case any longer. I don't you know that we'll do that. But there's no magic number. Um, yeah, we say was, we don't do it, but I, the best deals we ever did. I mean, yep. Superhuman <laughs> is one that like, I'm so happy I didn't turn that down uh, where we invested before he recruited anyone or incorporated, you know, right. committed to, and it turned into one of my favorite companies. Email is such a problem. I just love, you know, fixing yeah, my email with Superhuman. Things, thing, things that have a, a, such an obvious solution, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was able to say, this guy will be successful at recruiting people to work here and he'll be successful at raising the money to pay those people. And he's yep. got a track record of making the tech as a tech founder. And he's been through the whole thing and sold his last company to LinkedIn. So I was and, able to somehow be totally ready. And then I thought too, if we lose it all, we're diversified and it's a total, so what, who cares? Yeah, and, and coming full circle to our beginning of the conversation about operator, this is where your operator experience the, a, a purely financial investor would have passed, right? Yeah, and that's yeah, why I say, yeah. we say we don't do pre-revenue, but we have, and we've done it. Like, and we've done some in, in even in crypto a few years back that like, we're not crypto investors by any stretch of imagination, but like, like there was one or two that were like, wait a second, like this is actually solving a real problem. It's not the hype, right? And it's the operators inside of us that saw it, right? Right. Um, okay, and then final, final part in question is geography. You know, in what geographies do you focus on so people know when to reach out to you? Yeah, great question is because, um, you know, a lot of our, 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 our partners are overseas, which is just an accident of our founding, not actually as a strategic um, alignment. Um, and we look for companies that are have a global business model. So I actually don't care where you're based. I say that, but well over half the companies are based here in the Bay Area. Um, and then I think our second largest kind of um, amalgamation of companies would be in New York. Um, so I'd say about two thirds or, or more of the portfolio are in the United States in major, in major urban environments, right? You know, San Francisco, New York, like LA, Seattle kind of thing. But then we, we do have a, you know, a handful of companies around the world. So my point is I want a company that is building a global business, but you don't need to necessarily be global on day one. So if you are, you know, a few, a few people in, in a, I was going to say we work, but that's kind of funny. A few people working remotely, I guess now, um, and you're all in wherever, you know, Austin, New York, right? Silicon Valley. Um, and you're, but you're building something that's got a global business model. You don't necessarily need an office in Singapore or Tokyo or Barcelona on day one. Right? Actually, I would have discouraged you from doing that until like your series D, right? Um, on the flip side, if you are in Berlin, I don't want the Uber for Berlin or the Airbnb for Berlin. I want a company in Berlin okay. that wants the global scale of an Airbnb or an Uber, right? And that's the beauty of Silicon Valley, right? I joke. And, and there's, the real reason why Silicon Valley gets the predominance of, it's a supply and demand thing. The VCs are here 
because the, the startups are here, not the other way around, right? And the reason why the VCs are here and the startups are here is Silicon Valley understands how to build a global scale. Even though there's like this bias, I joke Silicon Valley thinks going global is selling to Texas. <laughs> um, but ultimately is because Silicon Valley is such a diverse place, probably because like Berkeley, Stanford, and a lot of other reasons, right? Um, the folks that come here, like no one's really from here. Like, I don't know how many people you know that were born here. I know like three people that were born here. The other million people I know are from someplace else, like myself, I'm from New York City, right? My wife's from New Jersey, right? Um, so ultimately people come here from somewhere else. So they know how to build these global businesses where I think, you know, two people in, you know, some city somewhere else in the world might not be thinking as globally, right? Um, but if you are, we're interested, right? Okay, uh, yeah, so no regional about... copycats, but you're, you're pretty open-minded. I think that's that's a, a good position to be in, in a world where a lot of people are wondering, why do I pay tax in California? It, and, it could, you know, could not agree more. <laughs> five million dollar garage that I don't want to show to my mother. So I think that people, people are, we're going to see the startups move around a bit more, but I don't I think Silicon Valley is going to disappear. I think some of the things that we have at play in Silicon Valley, which the only other place I see it is China, that you can, you have a funder for every stage from pre-seed to seed, to late yeah. siege to whatever, to or from guys Angel. roaming can, around in, in the accelerator, hoping to arb up to demo day and cut a check before. There's just every, and then there's growth. Like in Europe, there's exactly. a lot of soft money behind those funds. And there's not that many companies that'll write a $60 million check that gets you onto a stock exchange and then you become the big balance sheet buyer. So I think right. there's a lot of big balance sheet I, buyers right I, I here. I think that's changing in Europe in the long term though, because if you think, if you squint back and remember 10 years ago, you would go through an accelerator in Europe and then you'd come here to raise your seed round, here being Silicon Valley. Now there's enough seed funds in Europe to kind of accommodate that. And now those startups come here for like a series A or even a series B. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that that might change, but then again, who knows? Um, but I tend to agree with your, your assessment that Silicon well, Valley, you'll see a lot of movement of startups outside of Silicon Valley, but Silicon Valley is still gonna be pretty much um, a pretty special place. I think Europe has changed a lot for the better in the last 10 years, but what they're lacking is um, 100 companies within 30 minutes of your startup that can buy you. You know, yeah. you, you kind of have SAP, and I don't see a lot of big balance sheet buyers there. Whereas in China, you see Tencent, Ali, Baidu, there's a lot of companies that you can surf that dynamic of, we're going to dual track here. Someone wants to buy the company. We kind of don't want to sell now. Let's show that to investors where there's many of them all the way to growth. And you can kind of get that dual tracking dynamic. I think it's hard to get that replicated in Atlanta, let alone Berlin. Yeah. And I'm also thinking about that informal network. I'm looking out my window and I'm kind of connected to three other houses, right? So one of them, executive at Oracle, another one, general counsel yeah. at HP, another one, executive at Google, right? Right, um, right. And like, there's another guy right across the street, executive at Google, right? You know, so like your informal network here to those buyers, to those other sources of capital or to other VCs, right? Um, yeah, you know, but, is, but is, my, is my boys, important. I have twin boys that play soccer and lacrosse and everybody, almost every parent that I meet, I feel a little bad being like, hey, do you want to meet up for lunch? And, you know, I know the other guys on the Talk business. Team. Yeah. <laughs> you're accidentally bumping into people. But yeah. Stephen, great to see you. Uh, hope Thanks. to see you in the real world soon. Thanks so much for coming on the pod and uh, talk to you very soon. All right. Sounds good. Have a great weekend. Bye. Same to you. Bye.